you're investing in grow lights, it pays to choose something that's high quality and stylish. And that's where Soltech Solutions comes in. Their range of full spectrum photosynthetic plant lights are both sleek and modern, and they'll look right at home, whatever your decor. I know that because, well, I've got some. I took delivery of one of their bulbs and it screwed straight into my standard floor light fixture for a super quick setup. But if you need pendant lights or track lights, Soltech Solutions can help too. And when you buy a Soltech Solutions light, it comes with a five year warranty. So you can rest assured that your light is going to last. Check out Soltech Solutions range of lights now at soltechsolutions.com and get 15% off with code on the ledge. That's soltechsolutions.com and enter code on the ledge for 15% off. plant or not to plant that is the question that's a terrible question the answer is obviously to plant but there is a small theatrical angle on this week's show as i head to london to discover a hidden horticultural gem my name's jane perone host of this podcast on the ledge the aural destination for all things houseplant related. And in this episode, I visit the Barbican Conservatory in our great capital city of London to find out about the incredible plant collection there. And I answer a question about a Kentia palm. I do hope you've had a fabulous week. I've been doing my annual spring clean of the shed. <laughs> it took so long and it's still not finished, but it's very satisfying to clear up the disaster area. That was a lot of spilled potting mix and all kinds of mess. The shed is also home to my hardier, not hardy, but hardier cacti and succulents. So they've had their first watering. I need to go and check on them and make sure the whole thing hasn't collapsed into a pile of mush so fingers crossed the plant ledger is out if you've subscribed you should have received a copy in your inbox if you haven't subscribed remember it's only going out to people who have actually signed up specifically to the plant ledger you can sign up at janeperone.com there's a big link that says the plant ledger i'll also put a link in the show notes to this episode it's my roundup of the uk houseplant scene you don't have to be from the uk to subscribe but lots of the stuff in there is relevant to you if you are on the patreon front Irina became a legend and Lauren became a crazy plant person. And this coming Sunday, April the 10th, 2022, I'm hosting two Zoom sessions for Patreons at the legend and superfan level, one for each of those tiers. You will have a message in your inbox from me with that Zoom link if you are a patron subscriber at those levels. It's a chance to just chat, no set agenda just a chance to have a chat with me. So please do come and join me. And if you're not a Patreon subscriber and you want the chance to join these kind of things, then check out the show notes for details on how to do that. And thanks also to Loza P in the UK for leaving a lovely review for the show. And I've heard from several people saying, thank goodness you got rid of that water noise. And <laughs> if that's you, I'm really glad that you're happy about it. But it emphasises my point said before, and I'll repeat it again, if there's something you don't like in the show, if I've made a mistake, even if it's just a typo in the show notes, please do let me get no. Don't assume that somebody else is telling me this stuff because it's hearing back from you that enables me to make the show better. So any errors, mistakes, constructive criticisms, I would love to hear them. And you can drop that to ontheledgepodcast.gmail.com. I read everything and try to get back to you as many people as I can. I 
can't believe I've been travelling to London for visits all my life and yet I'd never been to the Conservatory at the Barbican. The Barbican is a really famous part of London. You may recognise it from its brutalist architecture. Basically, it's a massive lump of concrete and it's very fine theatre. The last play I saw there was Mr Benedict Cumberbatch in Hamlet. Yes, I was in the front row. Yes, I enjoyed every minute of it. But you may not know that the Barbican is also home to the second largest glass house in London. I met head gardener Marta Loftovich to find out more. Well, thank you very much on this snowy day. Well, it's not actually snowy in London, but I can tell you there were heavy flurries on my way here from Bedfordshire. So it felt rather strange that I was coming into this rather less snowy environment of the Barbican Conservatory. And we're stood here... And I, there's a lovely, is that a robin singing in the it background? Is. Actually, we've got two robins and they are starting to build their nest in here. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, well, I'm glad there's some wildlife enjoying the trees because you have got some really big trees in here. Mm-hmm. A high ceiling uh, set around this central concrete tower, the, the classic uh, Barbican architecture. Tell me a bit about... Lots of people don't know about this place. Tell us a bit about how it came to be here. Um, so, as you probably know, or you may not know, so city of, we're based in the city of London, in the heart of, the, of London, basically. And this part of the city of London was heavily bombed during the Second World War, simply because of the proximity to St Paul's Cathedral. Um, and after the war, obviously, uh, lots of buildings were in ruin. So, City of London, or Corporation, came up with the idea that they're going to build a new space they give uh, people somewhere to uh, live uh, and enjoy itself and that's how um, they came up with the idea of building the Barbican estate and obviously the Barbican centre so the project um, was um, designed by three architects Chamberwell, Powell and Bone and um, in the process of designing it and we're talking about 50s and 60s so that modernist brutalist architecture during the process of designing they have to design the theatre and in the old fashioned theatre I was told by the architect they have to build what is called the fly tower so the tower that holds all the flyers so the backgrounds for the theatre and it's, as you can see it's in front of you this massive concrete monstrosity <laughs> uh, it was a little bit ugly looking and uh, so they tried to disguise it by building conservatory around it. On the original drawings or um, drawings, architect drawings, you can see that there was always idea to build a glass house in here. The original ones was actually designed as a pyramid in Louvre. So that was that sort of um, triangle shape. But obviously the, with the time it evolved and evolved into this place. So the fly tower... Uh, it actually divides the conservatory to two spaces, so the west-facing space and the east-facing space, simply how we are orientated around the world. Um, this shows the power of plants, really, to take, as you say, this brutalist architecture and soften it mm-hmm. with lovely plants. So we've got some hanging plants. We've got, I can see, uh, Monstra Deliciosa up there. I can see Dracaena trees. There's lots of lovely plants in here. What uh, climate is this kept to? Mm-hmm. So we are sec- London's second largest glass house after the uh, temperate glass house in the Kew Gardens and we have separate, uh, similar uh, temperate regime. So we are temperate glass house. So the temperatures in here will be as low as 11 degrees in the winter and obviously uh, as high as possible in the a, in a <laughs> summer. Uh, and also we have a section for our arid or succulent plants where the temperature will fall uh, as low as 8 degrees basically in the winter. It's all heated, but as I said, the heating is kept to minimal for um, basically for the plants to survive and live. It's literally, uh, I guess it's you're in a heat island at the City of London and this is your own little heat island, but it's not that hot. As you say, it doesn't feel a sauna-like environment. It just feels comfortable, mm-hmm. doesn't it? So when people think about it and see it on their photos, they think straight, but they think it's a tropical jungle. We mimic that, but it's not the tropical jungle feel. So if we're lucky to travel to tropical jungle, you can imagine that heat and mist. Sometimes in the summer, if the, we get more summer, uh, hot 
summers in in London, especially due to the climate change. It will get in hot, hot in here. But people say like, oh, why don't you spray more water? If I spray more water in here, it will be like a sauna, as you said, <laughs> too hot. You couldn't breathe. And it happens sometimes if we water on a really hot summer day. We water try to water in the in the morning. So when the water evaporates, obviously the heat will be it's maybe not the heat it's the humidity of it yeah. that we're not <laughs> used to it. <laughs> yeah it's, that can that can get pretty unpleasant i can imagine there are some challenges to gardening in this kind of environment not least handling some of these very very tall trees and climbers coming off these balconies do you have to get out the climbing rope sometimes? How do you keep it looking good? Uh, yes. So basically when the Barbican was designed as a building um, back in the 50s, 60s, health and safety was not the <laughs> agenda. Uh, so although it looks lovely, we sometimes have to put a lot of climbing gear, safety gear to go into and do some plants. We came up with um, some weird and wonderful ideas. We lose, use lots of uh, long pole saws to cut some plants that we can access if there's something which we can't do, like we try to call in every year at the arborists, so they will reduce the crown of our uh, trees because they will grow and eventually we cannot move the roof. So we will try to uh, <laughs> reduce the crown to, for the trees to fit within um, the conservatory. And also by doing that, we allow more light for the lower growing plants to, to thrive, basically, in the spring and summer and, uh, and the winter months especially. I can see a real diversity of plants in here. Tell me about some of the stars of oh, the show. <laughs> so we got 1,500 species in here. 300 of them are succulents and the cactuses. Um, the stars, oh, it's, it's tricky to say because we got so many <laughs> uh, individual plants that is really, really difficult to pinpoint. We got some rare endangered species. Uh, so we got Obetia fissifolium, so it's a nettle uh, family tree and it's actually in danger in their native um, habitats. By the way, we didn't go there and poach them. Uh, <laughs> they just happened to, they were donated to us, happened to be there. We got some, uh, especially in the in the cactuses uh, section, we got lots of uh, cactuses from Mexico, like Lofofra williamsi, so your peyote, that is endangered um, in the wild um, native habitats but wherever you look it probably each plant during the whole the growing year in here is a star for different reasons because mm. we've got a collection of pelargoniums that they will be stars during the summer months in the late summer early autumn probably it would be taken overtaken by chilies that you know will world of weird and wonderful shapes and, and things like that. In the winter we got orchids, cold glass, glass house orchids we've got some mediums now that are flowering so it's ever changing. We've got beds of paradise and what is wonderful in this place when people come in here and because London is so diverse each plant is brings back the memories for them of their mm. home, of their parents of their travel so for the people who visit us different plants are different stars basically so that's how I try to measure you know this the success of of the place or the stardom of, of the plants if that makes sense that does make sense and you're right some plea can have a, a plant that sparks off a particular memory of uh, of home or, or relatives I mean I guess with the one that possibly is iconic is the Monstera deliciosa and you really are showing how this plant even though it's growing up concrete you're showing how this plant grows um, as opposed to how we have it in a little tiny pot in the house because it's romping away up this uh, wall here is that one that people particularly want to photograph and look at so if you go through instagram feed um that's probably one of your popular platform now to go through you will see that one of the most photographed uh, mm. plants in here there will be monstera deliciosa and we do have the variegated versions in here that are quite old and they show the lovely variegation of them but you're right that's how they grow in their natural habitats in mexico and they sort of semi-climbing trailing just create that massive abundance of leaves and when we think about them in in our average uh, house plants, um, you know, we buy them as a little, little cuttings. Sometimes they don't even have the fenestration. We wait for the fenestration, but we don't realise how, or people don't realise in generally how big they will grow. <laughs> I, I've got it with my own sister. She was like, oh, I'd love to have them. I said, like, you realise your flat is <laughs> not big enough yeah. to sustain yeah. that plant. Um, and that, well, if you look 
a majority of those plants, you probably can recognize them from your house plants because they are your house plants just grown to the size of the space, basically. That's what happened with them. Mm-hmm. You l- let them loose a little bit. And is that an Araucaria Norfolk Island pine there yes, that so I'm that's seeing? Yes, Araucaria heterophylla. As we should see. Again, another plant that people grow as a house plant. And, but mm-hmm. really here, there you're seeing its potential to get very large yeah. and, and very beautiful. But yes, um, a lot, I think lots of people struggle with that. But it, it's, a, it's a really beautiful tree. And what are these trees on the other side here? We've got, you've got a sort of four really tall trees here, which I don't, can't immediately recognize, but I'm thinking ficus. Yeah, you're thinking right. <laughs> and if you think about 70s and 80s, that's your staple for every household. So it's yeah. Ficus Benjamin. Oh, it is. Okay. So you, it's just, I mean, that, again, you look at that and go, oh, yeah, that's why that plant hits your ceiling and gets too big because they're enormous. Exactly. They are absolutely <laughs> enormous. And as I said before, every year they get pruned and the crown gets reduced by two thirds, actually. Yeah, wow. So you can imagine how quickly and how big they can grow in the right conditions. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes, and you don't have the problem of people, that people have uh, in their homes of moving them about and then all the leaves falling off because obviously these are presumably planted into the ground. How is the soil set up here? So uh, the funny fact is that we're based on the third floor. So underneath our offices, um, theatres and all the things that make barbecue working. So our beds are not super deep. So on the deepest points, they are 1.3 metres deep. Um, some of them are shallower and the ficuses were planted as a little babies. If I showed you the archive photos, they were just your size of your average house plant mm. and they just, over the 40 years that have been here, they just grown to the size that you, you just see. So those kind of two, three floors almost. Um, it's really interesting to see what their bark actually looks like yeah. because we're not really used to seeing that. They've got lovely, smooth, um, very pale grey bark, which is actually rather lovely. Yeah, it is. It's almost like um, sometimes if I look on them in the right mornings or when you catch the light, it's almost like it's glistening. That yeah, to it's beautiful. To it. Yeah, well, there you go. That's another example of how we sort of underestimate the potential of houseplants to get huge. Um, and is there anything here that perhaps wouldn't be well known as a houseplant but could work in, in a home setting, things that you might be able to try at home that, so there people is, don't grow. Um, so there is one particular plant that is my favourite and I always recommend it for the dark corners uh, in the houses that people mostly struggle about. And it's a well-known plant, but it's a little bit forgotten at the moment. So it's Aspidistra. Um, Aspidistra. Elatio. Elatio, yeah. <laughs> One of uh, my favourites as well. Although, yes, it is, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think it's coming back now. People are starting to is, grow yeah. it again. There is a smaller version, which is CRISPR, Aspidistra CRISPR, and it has a white dot on them. And there's even a rarer version, which, is, has, which has a variegation on it. So you can have the leaf variegated with, with white because variegation is not, on, not necessary. White can be yellow as well, just to... Yeah, that. yeah. Oh, well, that's a, that is a good choice and uh, one of my favourites. Although I, I have a variegated one, but I found that the variegation indoors just didn't come very well. And I put it outside and the variegation seemed to flourish. So I don't know whether that's just probably light. <laughs> it is. All the variegations are related to the light. So mm. the more light they get, the variegated plants, they will come up with better variegation. But equally, um, sometimes you see... Uh, and I'll go back to the Monstera, uh, variegated Monstera. <clears throat> so you see it on the photos, the beautiful leaves with hardly any variegation. They're almost mm-hmm. white, if not white. If they were planted on their own, they would not survive because they don't have enough chlorophyll in them to sustain them and keep them growing. So yes, the, the variegation is nice, but you don't want to encourage too much of it. And you will probably notice as well, the variegated plant will grow slower. Mm, because mm. they will need more chlorophyll that green to keep them uh, going. Yeah, it's it's a trade-off, isn't it? And this place is open to members of the public um, part of the time. So if people are coming to London, they can look on the Barbican website. Do you have, do you have to book in advance still? How is it working now? So at the moment, you have to check for the dates because we share the space between lots of different types of events. Uh, but all the dates are released roughly two weeks in advance. Uh, so it's best to check on the website, pre-book it, the ticket, uh, and all the dates and tickets will be released. There are half an hour slots uh, still, I think. 
but the tickets are free of charge so you can get in here and we won't charge you anything and you can spend as much time as you want inside of here uh, as I said, you have to just uh, pre-book it in advance. It's super popular, unfortunately. Yeah, I bet. Uh, if you want to get a ticket, uh, but I will give you a good tip. Sometimes on a day, there are some extra tickets oh, okay. released. Oh, so if you're not lucky, uh, you can try to do it uh, in a day. And do you have any problems with people who don't realise that it's not okay to take cuttings of plants from your from your space i think yeah i think and like most of the spaces like that q chelsea physic mm. garden and any space that you can imagine that i've got a collection of plants and especially house plants that have been so popular and even during the pandemic if, if you have a collection of rare plants yes people think they are it's okay to take a cutting or they will ask us and we say we're really sorry but we don't you know donate or give away cuttings or even sell them um, because simply if I had 100 people within a week to ask for a cutting, there will be no plant left, <laughs> basically. Some of them are very, very, very difficult uh, to obtain, to propagate it, um, you know, to grow. But yes, there are some people. We have some information to try to discourage people from stealing them or taking cuttings but mm. unfortunately it happens yeah and you're right it's a problem across all gardens that are open yeah. to the public um i'm noticing a couple of other plants that i just wanted to, to mention i'm loving that um i can never remember what the current latin name is the purple tradescantia up there coming down trailing down off the balcony there so the old Latin name is because it, I it's changed. Pinfibrera. Has yeah. it changed again? I can't remember. It's, with the botany in the names, it changed constantly, <laughs> and you have to be really quick to keep. Yeah, up with I it. think it's commonly called purple heart or something like that. Yes. But that looks so stunning the way you got it pouring down off that um, that balcony. Yes, um, it's, trimming that. <laughs> yes, a we challenge. Trim, yeah, it's a challenge on its own. I mean, you can see some of the window boxes has been trimmed. Uh, so we try to do it with the same time as the arborist comes, so we get a good clear out in the conservatory, and then everything is ready uh, to grow. We don't trim them every year. We try to keep them, you know, every few years trimmed. But yes, it, it's a challenge. It's a. It's surprisingly. A lot of plants. It doesn't yeah. look from the bottom like that. But yeah, yeah so I'm sure. Plants. And I'm sure when you lift up that and look at the back of it, it looks, you know, like that. So I always find with like big trailing plants like that, the back is kind of another challenge altogether to it is. <laughs> and remove dead sometimes leaves. Sometimes if I go there, I think how on earth they are growing <laughs> because there's not a lot of soil that they have in that window mm. box and how on earth they are holding together because... You touch them and sometimes they're quite brittle. Mm. I think like for well, that abundance of that, they just yeah create that I fantastic thing. It's it is it's well it's not a green wall, it's a purple wall, but it's very it's very lovely. Now we've already heard the robin. Do you have other wildlife coming in here? So we have the blackbirds as well, and they try to sometimes nest in here. Uh, we had on one occasion a duck. A mallard uh, from the lake below coming in here and happily swimming in our uh, lake, but we thought it's a bit too much and we sort of um, encourage them to go the wrong way. <laughs> and we sometimes get a cheeky squirrel, but then again, yeah. we try to encourage the, the squirrels um, to get out because unfortunately they will nibble on our plants and imagine. they will destroy some I of our plants. Imagine. Tell me about this plant, Dion spanulosum. So, <laughs> so that is the, one of the oldest living plants in the oh, air. It comes right. from the dinosaur era. So you can imagine. So cool. I mean, this one doesn't come from the Well, no, obviously. Plant. But it's, yeah, it's a really ancient plant. And it's so, it's got these amazing serrated uh, pinnate leaves on these fronds. They're what an amazing, sharp. I bet. They are very sharp. It, they're very difficult um, to prune because you have to have long sleeves and things like that. Over yeah. the pandemic, it flowered. Oh wow! Uh, and it had a male flower because they are um, two separate males and females are separate flowers. So we found out that he's a male. Okay. And do you ha you don't have a female? No, we don't have a female. We have another <laughs> one, but we sus suspect it's a male as well. So okay. we do not produce uh, the um, the seeds as such. Oh yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> We'll 
return to my Barbican visit shortly, but now it's time for Question of the Week, which comes from Catcher and Concerns, a trio of Kentia palms. These quintessential Victorian palms are quite something, and lucky old Catcher to have three of them. And Katia is considering using Lechusa Pon in the substrate of her Kentia palms, mixing that in with the regular substrate. Will it work? Well, I very much suspect it will catch you. Howia fosteriana is a species of palm that only comes from the tiny speck between Australia and New Zealand. That is Lord Howe Island. I dedicated a whole chapter of my forthcoming book, Legends of the Leaf, to this plant. And the speck, well, basically the island is made up of an ancient eroded volcano. So you can imagine the soil there is pretty volcanic and free draining. So I think that adding Lechusa Pond, which, as we know, is a mix that includes lava and pumice, would be a really good choice for these palms. If you remember back to my Lechusa episode, I'll stick a link to it in the show notes, there are different ways of using pond and you don't have to use pure pond. You can add it to your mix, either using the 25% rule where it's a drainage level separated from the soil with a drainage barrier. The 50% rule where you've got the root ball covered with soil and then you've got pond around that. I think there's also probably a third option, which is just you mix in handfuls of pond with your substrate when you're repotting and it's spread throughout the mix. I think that would work equally well. The great thing about this particular palm is that it's tough. That's why it was really popular in the Victorian era and much beloved by Queen Victoria. And it can cope with all kinds of abuse. But certainly adding some pond to the mixture I would imagine is only going to make the plant happier. The reason why it's happy in our homes is because they're quite similar actually to the weather on Lord Howe Island which is I think it's defined as cool or warm subtropical so temperatures are are sort of 20 to 25 centigrade um, in the summer and then about down to about a minimum of 14 centigrade in the winter that's about 57 Fahrenheit so They live in similar conditions in their natural habitat. And then, of course, in our homes, we can offer them something pretty similar without too much effort. And because of where they live, often quite close to the sea in coastal parts of the island, because basically the whole island is is kind of coastal, they've evolved to deal with things like drought stress and shading from bigger trees and also salty air as well. They're really fascinating plants, Kentias, and should be more widely grown. Can't wait to bring you loads more fascinating stuff about Kentia palms in that chapter of the book, which features everything from the tree lobster of Lord Howe Island to sympatric speciation, which is basically the enigma of the fact that two very similar palm species had evolved on one very small island. And in fact, the reason for that can be explained by the soil. So, yeah, more of that in the book. But given that Kentias sit right on a volcanic island, I think a bit of pond will do them no harm. Thanks for your question, Catcher. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, please do drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. And now... I'm back in the Barbican Conservatory and we're heading to the special area reserved for cacti and succulents. Where are we, Marta? So we are what we call an arid house. So where we keep all our cactuses and succulents. So every cactus is a succulent, but not every succulent is a cacti. Yes, and you've also got some orchids in here which are looking very fine and in flower right now. Mm -hmm. There are so many things in here that I absolutely love. Your lepismium there is is flowering. Not mine is also flowering. It's not quite as big as that. But you've got lots of plants which cactus and succulent lovers will recognise, but maybe haven't seen quite this large, because <laughs> there are some really big specimens in here. This must be one of the favourite areas for people to visit because they're just so charismatic. These plants, aren't they? 
Yes, it is. I mean, with talking to the public, lots of people say the, the Arid House is their favourite. Unfortunately, we had to keep it closed um, simply due to the restrictions that we just recently had because it's a quite enclosed and small space. And it's also, as I said before, there's lots of uh, precious plants in here or rare mm. and endangered that are quite an um, easy target for mm. <laughs> for people. But we try to, you know grow them as much as we can and for display hopefully in the future i'm just staring at this massive crassula with these beefy beefy <laughs> stems and trunk is that a, that's actually not ju- that's a is it golem or one of those kind of it is it's a golem version so we've got uh, three or four different uh crassula. so we've got your standard money trees here crassula that just uh finished uh, flowering we've got the variegated version the humo mm. sunset version which is a like a yellowy red variegation and also we've got the minor so a much better for your standard home of that yeah. version <laughs> because they do get very large I mean that mm-hmm. is I mean I don't know what five, four or five foot tall and it's just chunky that is a chunk of a plant I'm loving it it, it is it's, um, <laughs> five foot six so this is bigger than i am yeah you can imagine yeah it is and um it's it's good to see what these plants turn into i think that's one of the things that uh you're really getting from that and you've got lots of hanging baskets with beautiful epiphyllums ripsalis a very impressive um sedum burrows tail I mean, is it a, is it difficult to, to water these hanging baskets? It, so we got have uh, you got special equipment. Please so tell me you've got, got something. You can see there's a pipe going ah. on the top, and it's an irrigation system, so we okay. can just water the hanging basket. It's much easier. Everything else in the conservatory is watered by hand, so with the houses. So we don't run around with the little watering cans. Uh, <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> imagine dungarees and the watering cans. But yeah, we've got houses, and we water everything by hand because it's such a mixed and varied collection. Uh, the best computer is our brain, so yeah. we can adjust the watering uh, to suit the needs of a day or temperatures, and obviously to the plants itself. How on earth do you avoid getting prickled to death when you're doing work on some of these really large columnar cacti? Uh, is it is it a side effect of the job that you end up? It is. You are getting used to do it, I think. Oh, very often we try to put long sleeves. Um, but you can imagine in the heights of summer it can be difficult um, you sometimes get a funny looks in the train or buses from people when you stick a hand and they all scratch out but I think it's a side of a job <laughs> yeah and I mean it must be just a delight apart from in the very hottest days must be a delightful place to work um, I'm just sorry I'm just getting distracted by that huge Pereskia that's amazing. I mean, the, the leafy, oh, I always think of it as the leafy cactus, but that is, oh, was it actually? Rose cactus is its common name, apparently. But that is just, it looks like something out of a children's imagination of a cactus. It's got these huge areoles with these enormous spikes on this quite skinny stem. Mm-hmm. And then the leaves on the top, it's just an incredible plant. Are there any particular favourites in here of yours, cacti that you particularly love? Um, the non-spiky ones, maybe. Non-spiky <laughs> ones. So probably the Lofofra, the tiny um, peyote, uh, simply because it grows one centimetre a year. Um, so you can, in a good condition, so you can imagine how endangered they are if they mm. grow so slow. Um, and other than that, I mean, they are so lovely and they have all the, so much shapes and forms and it's so difficult to pinpoint um, every single one. You look on the massive Akima Cactus with Sonny, the mm. mother-in-law chair, you can imagine why they call that down the thing. Um, I think mother-in-laws get a really bad rap from they plants, do, don't they? And I don't, don't they? understand that, you know, but lots of plants have uh, some strange connotations to, <laughs> to mother-in-laws. And, uh, to all mother-in-laws... I don't believe it's true. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, I guess the other name is golden barrel cactus. Yeah. I mean, they do look like bar- yours are just enormous. Um, yes, I've got a tiny one of those, and you do kind of have to remember, yeah, that's what it's going to turn into eventually. Mm-hmm. They are enormous. It does. It, lots of those cactuses were donated to us uh, by King Cactus Collectors okay. over the years, um, simply because their collections were too big. Um, yeah. They couldn't care after them, so they wanted for them to grow somewhere that where they'd be looked at 
and hopefully we do them a justice. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a lovely space to have filled with cacti, and I'm sure it's glass everywhere, so the cacti are happy. They've got plenty of light in here. Um, we didn't really talk about whether you have enough of plants at work or whether you have plants at home. Do you... Do you I do have plants do you, at home. <laughs> Well, you're a glutton for punishment. Yeah. Uh, so I do have a lot of house plants. I live in a flat, um, so I don't have a balcony or the gardens. Uh, so I do have a lot of house plants uh, at home. Uh, the only thing is with my house plants is once you water this or you do all the um, jobs in here, you tend to choose your house plants wisely. The ones that don't need a lot of attention or they are relatively easy going. You can forget about watering from time to time <laughs> uh, and they will still be lush and beautiful so what are your choices then give it let us into your secrets oh uh, <laughs> so there will be orchids basically uh i i'm a little bit of a person who buys this saddest plant <laughs> on the shelf you know the discounted <laughs> ones oh well, we'll rescue you and all that stuff your uh, pileas, peperomias, your standard house plants, even your ficus elastica will do without any watering. So if you're worried about your house plants going on the holidays, I can guarantee you if you water them properly once a week after week's holidays, they will be absolutely mm. fine. I've got uh, some of the codex plants, so quite a few of them. Um, my son started to collect some cactuses and I'm dreading that. <laughs> <laughs> for the passion to uh, basically explode um, but yeah we I've got what well, I counted around 60 of them at home okay well it's obviously not enough time spent with plants well that's a, and it's great if you can if you're obviously passionate doing it at home and at work so that that must be a big tick well it's it's absolutely glorious in here uh, I could just spend all day just staring at the plants in here and enjoying them because there are some wonderful things. I mean, I'm just, I just keep thinking of the logistics for you of dealing with some of these huge epiphyllums and ripsalis, and I just salute you because <laughs> it must be um, a real battle sometimes repotting some of these it bigger is. hanging baskets. Yeah, we are actually bracing ourselves for the repotting season. So yeah. what happens, because you can see some of the epiphyllums already have some flowers mm. on them. So we will let them flower this year. And usually they flower around May time. So every single epiphyllum is covered by this fantastic, massive flowers. I'm talking the palm mm. of, your, of your hand. Uh, lots of vivid colours and once they start to fade we will repot them because we have some cuttings that we propagated well, we're they just seeing some buds up on that one this yeah, one right yeah, above yeah, us there's yeah. some buds coming yeah, yeah. so they won't be thrown away they'll be moved probably somewhere yeah. to one of our levels in a good spot but they will need to be refreshed because some of them will get woody and tired mm, over mm. the years I mean, I think that's, it's an interesting thing coming in here when you see these much more mature plants. You know, we're used to seeing a teeny little tiny, um, you know, cactus or whatever. And then when it starts to get some corking or some woodiness, people panic. And you have to sort of say, well, that's actually completely normal. This is what happens as they get bigger. Um, they don't stay sort of pure green. Um, and this is a perfect example of of how they change as, the, as they age. Yeah, so uh, the, the cockiness, as you said, or woodiness, I mean, it's two factors. Sometimes it's due to the conditions that they grow. So if there's too moist, they will protect themselves by producing that uh, sort of callus or cockiness. But over the years, the stem, as you said, gets more woody and woody, and that's how they will be in the, your natural habitats. You will travel to Canary Islands, Mexico, um, wherever South Africa you see them, and they will be like that. Only the tops are, will be nice and fresh and green. And also, you know, I, I get asked, like, sometimes, oh, there's some dead leaves, or, um, you know, the palms have not all the leaves removed, and it's not perfect and manicured. <laughs> Yes, because they are living, mm. living objects like living plants. They're not like that in the in the nature. We we get used to, to it to see them in them, um, you know, more artificial environments where they don't have the palms don't have their scares of dead leaves. They're just all manicured in the hotels in the rows of streets. But nature is is completely different. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, I think it's just a uh, you know, if a plant gets to a good age, then it's got a few a few marks to show. <laughs> to age, show yeah, it it's like we age <laughs> yeah we, exactly you know we showed our marks plants show our marks so that yeah. just shows how they basically go through their life 
Well, thank you so much for showing me this lovely space. And um, I'm just going to be in here just taking some deep breaths and taking some photos now. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed that tour around the Barbican Conservatory. And if you want to check out some images, do visit the show notes at janeperone.com. There you'll also find details of how to get your free tickets to the Barbican Conservatory and a list of the plants mentioned in this episode. That's all for this week's show. I shall be back next Friday. I hope your week is infused with chlorophyll and flooded with sunlight. Bye! The music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Komiku, and After the Flames by Josh Woodward. The ad music was Dill Pickles by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.